Great, thank you. <clears throat> Um, I really hope my talk doesn't go too too long. I, I've timed it out. It's actually run. It runs a little bit long, but it's going to have the question and answers built into the front and to the back of it. So just to give you an idea of the structure of that, I will be trying to to sort of uh, conform to the format, but it might seem a little long. So. Against my better judgment, and at the risk of sounding more like a fan than as a scholar, I want to start with a provocation from our guest lecturer, Marlon James. During the 2019 Tolkien lecture he delivered at Pembroke College at Oxford, he lingered over a line in Vanity, a Vanity Fair's cover story about Michael B. Jordan, in which the actor discussed myth-making for black people. Jordan said, I'm gonna try to use, I've never used a clicker before. Uh? No? I'm really bad at this. Um, yeah. he, Jordan said, we don't have any mythology, black mythology or folklore. Creating our own mythology is very important because it helps dream. James astutely pushes past the uninteresting question of whether or not what Jordan says is right or wrong, and instead lingers over the much more difficult issue of determining what the absence of myth does, what is made possible by turning to myth, and what damage is done when myth is weaponized or used to veil instead of reveal. And now to sound more like an academic than a fan, I, what I, I have what I hope to, is a productive quibble and a change of emphasis that will lead me to Du Bois and some larger discussions of appropriation. What is curious about Jordan's statement is that, uh, is that the black-centric Marvel movie, Black Panther, had just catapulted him from a charismatic actor to stardom was an appropriation of a comic book, which was itself appropriating from H. Ryder Haggard's white colonialist fantasy, King Solomon's Minds, which was in turn borrowing from a host of other sources. And I'll be returning to Black Panther in a second. Uh, and as I readily admit, this is just a quibble, but I think this observation leads me to wonder to what extent, when we look at the intersection of race and genre fiction, we must contend with the politics that underlie appropriation. James, in his lecture, unpacks the critique that when writers of high literature move to genre fiction, they're slumming, an artistic faux pas that is complicated when done by a person of color. He opposes that opinion on the grounds that, of how inescapable certain truths in fiction that emerge from myth are, and that to excavate mythology on the way to building new myths is essential to good writing. Here again, I cannot help but agree, and I would press further on the notion of return to raise the accompanying concern with temporality of such myth-making, specifically the feeling of belatedness when racial elements considered to be anachronistic are overlaid upon familiar tropes, or perhaps more troublingly, when we pick up the latest novel by James or N.K. Jemisin or listen to the music of Janelle Monet and realize that we must unlearn the tropes that we have become accustomed to in the works of writers like Tolkien who have so thoroughly framed our conceptions of genre fiction. I'll be using Du Bois as the avatar for some questions I would like to explore with you today in relationship to appropriation, race, and temporality. I will do so by considering his use of medieval and early modern tropes throughout his writing, particularly in spaces that would seem to call for empirical analysis. Du Bois's speculative writing, ironically, was seen by, for much of the last century, as quite the opposite of slum slumming. It was a kind of racial betrayal because of the tropes he chose to employ that distanced, distanced him from demotic writing, writing about the street. Moreover, this branch of writing seemed to fall victim to the critique of belatedness, quite at odds with the acknowledged forward thinking that made him such a distinguished thinker. And finally, I'd like to explore how Du Bois uh, talked about dreams. And this is a change of emphasis uh, from this quote that I alluded to before. If we were to be, think about the forefront of acts of, uh, if we were at the forefront of acts of creation or recreation of the mythology of black artists, I would like to think about what it means to dream, which I find to be one of the most difficult parts of the sentiment to grapple with. Du Bois' dreams were public ones, but were often misapprehended. What it mean, does it mean to be denied the opportunity to dream or for your moments of dreaming to be inconven uh, inconvenient, thus fugitive or unseeable? So to begin with, I want to show you a curious set of lines from one of Du Bois' opinion pieces in which he anticipates a trip through, Rome, through, through Europe. When this is read, I shall be sailing on the sea. The peace of the sea will be with me. Its silence, its infinite depths and heights. I shall be surrounded by snobs and fools, and there will be problems of placing me in the dining room and smoker. I shall not mind. I shall be free and gorgeously alone. I shall read silly romances and stare at nothing, and sleep and sleep. 
I'm interested in this passage in part because of where it deviates from the familiar tropes of transatlantic crossing that we come across so frequently in African American literature. He does mention the uncomfortable transition from the vitriolic racism he was familiar with in the United States to his expectation of better treatment in Europe. However, he also includes this tantalizing detail about the silly romances he expects to read on his passage across the ocean, a slipping silly a slipping romances in his private moments on the ocean. Reading this comes as a bit of a surprise. Although he was always interested in, uh, in both in the forms of medieval romance and also scientific romance or science fiction, it's not until recently that they've gained serious critical attention, particularly with the rediscovery of an experimental short story called The Princess Steel, um, that some of you might have heard about, um, by Britt Russert and Adrian Brown, that shows Du Bois's interest in what we might call Afrofuturism. And I'll discuss what the story's about in a second and the problems with that label in a second. Before I get there, I'd like to make a brief sidebar about the problems with Du Bois' criticism that will be important for understanding the stakes of this talk. Du Bois is one of the few African-American authors of this period scholars often com confidently claim to really know, both in terms of their habits, their reading habits, and the influences that reading had on their intellectual production. I could cite a dozen influential articles and books that convincingly argue that Du Bois was thoroughly immersed in intellectual frameworks that make him an avowed pragmatist, a sociologist, a pan-Africanist, a modernist, an elitist, and also a Marxist. Uh, and here are some examples from books and uh, an article that do just that, who they sort of, he's sort of the champion of, every, of everything. To us medievalists and early modernists, this will sound like a scholarly quibble, but I hope to unpack why this might have meaning in our fields. This habit of categorizing Du Bois is understandable, but potentially damaging to coming to terms with the complexity of the author and perhaps for framing the discussion of black speculative fiction more generally. On one hand, you see the tremendous explanatory power this, uh, this move might have. The pur proposal to read Du Bois through the lens of Afrofuturism has gained new transcendency because Du Bois' legacy as both an early producer and consumer of speculative fiction is being defined during the efflorescence of black speculative fiction from Africa and across the African diaspora. And, it is, and Du Bois is being put at the front of this tradition. One only needs to put a look at the story of the Princess Steel and the movie Black Panther to see suggestive resemblances. Just to sketch the story for you, The Princess Steel begins with the unpromising premise of a couple seeking to hear a lecture on sociology to test their pet theories on the discipline. They're disappointed to find out that the professor is an African-American man and are yet more perturbed to learn that he uses a megascope that he compares to a medieval scrying stone to bring forth images of the past, what he describes as the Great Chronicle. And what appears before the husband in the, uh, in the couple are visions of white colonization and resource exploitation allegorized by knights in combat over a princess in a far off spectacular land. Black Panther's narrative of royalty, far flung kingdoms, vast resources, and incredible technologies is consonant with Du Bois's story about a megascope that can see through time and space and into the struggle over a princess who is read as a type of medieval re a resource. Both meditate on African migration, labor, and resource exploitation, and the nature of global historical processes more broadly as they affect black lives. On the other hand, there's a danger in constructing such a lineage. The Princess Steel and Black Panther are just as dissonant in their overt and implicit stances on capitalism and the possibilities of technology itself for yielding utopian solutions to large-scale racial problems that they outline. When they are linked as black speculative fictions, the critical purchase of that category, and particularly black speculative fiction as inherently a political response to technology that reproduce white power is unclear. Black Panther concludes with a racial, its radical black figure dead, as well as an argument for gentrification in Oakland and UN intervention elsewhere in the world. And it also somehow slips a, a reference to Disneyland into it too. Uh, du Bois instead is searching out the origins of capitalism and racial exploitation while rec reckoning with the seductive simplicity of allegory. So these supposedly allied texts could not be further apart. The desire to recruit Du Bois into a particular critical lineage is common in criticism of the author. Cornell West's The American Evasion of Philosophy, A Genealogy of Pragmatism, provides a parallel illustration of misappropriation's dangers. When discussing the American intellectual tradition of pragmatism, West identifies a fundamental problem in reading the author through the peculiarities of his worldview. Writing, as a highly educated black intellectual, Du Bois himself often scores the barbarisms, sometimes confused with Africanisms, shot through Afro-American culture. I count 18 allusions to the backwardness of black folk. He even goes as far as to support a form of paternalism that leads back towards black self-determination. 
West situates Du Bois within a tradition of philosophical pragmatism and critiques him for being under the sway of elite European modes of thinking. And of course, West has a point. Much of Du Bois', du Bois training led him to indeed prioritize epistemical models that West could consider to be antithetical to African American cultures. And yet I would suggest that Du Bois makes a complicated use of European paradigms more complicated than he's given credit for. This quotation from Du Bois' book Dark Waters shows in miniature the strange stance that he had borrowed from the West. Writing, laboriously the Middle Ages built its rules on fairness, equal armament, equal notice, equal conditions. What do we see today? Machine guns against sagais, sugar, uh, conquest sugared with religion, mutilation and rape masquerading as culture. All this with vast applause at the superiority of white over black soldiers. Behold little Belgium and her pitiable plight, but, what has, the but has the world forgotten Congo? What Belgium now suffers is not half, not even a tenth of what she has done to black Congo since Stanley's great dream of 1880. Down the dark forests of inmost Africa sails this modern Galahad in the name of the noble-minded men of several nations to introduce commerce and civilization. What came of it? Du Bois threads this brief digression about the chivalric history of, of Europe into his political discussion of Europe's intervention into Africa. This argument mirrors familiar anti-colonial points he would make throughout his life. However, a romantic temporality and notion of conduct limbs his assertions about the relative powers of Europeans and Africans, out of which emerges the paternalism that he only abandoned quite late in his career. He compares the tools of war and the historical legacies of invading forces in favorable terms against the Congolese. The recurring problem uh, presented is the disjunction between the promises and, of medieval legacies, equal armaments, equal notice, equal conditions, and their actualization. As this quote begins to show, Du Bois applies the temporalities and imaginaries comporting with a broader literary act that reveals his own ambivalence towards the larger cultural frameworks to which he's so frequently tied. He deploys tropes and language borrowed from European imaginaries to make systemic critiques of those powers and then to speculate on how people of color disrupt the impositions of those motives for racial world making. Particularly his practices as an avid reader of romance informs his intellectual habits as a sociologist and historian to, as he put it, correct the omissions, misinterpretations, and deliberate lies in the previous depictions of the Negro's past. And while this example is minor compared to his sustained romances, it illustrates the intimacies and unlikely uh, products of Du Bois' intellectual maneuvers consonant with his interest in romance. Romance precedes enlightenment modes of knowledge production he sees as, in, as, as part of validating African cultures to Western eyes, even though romance itself is at issue. And this is the territory I'd like to quickly cover in my, uh, my, my talk today. I will discuss what I call Du Bois' romantic consciousness, his use of tropes of medieval romance and the genre, romance genre more broadly in his writing. And I consciously use this term romantic consciousness to recall his far more famous diagnosis of African-American double consciousness, what for a long time was the clearest legacy of Du Bois, his diagnosis of the split at the center of the African-American psyche, which yielded a type of knowing gaze cast upon American society. He writes in the first chapter of his Souls of Black Folk, uh, and most of us are familiar with this line, the Negro is a sort of seventh son born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world that yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of another world. It's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on him in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels that his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps him from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is the history of the strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. The stance on the fracture inherent in American, African American identity and the internal strife occupying subject positions that are at time antagonistic to each other is complicated when read in a relationship to his approach to romance and the gaze that is enabled by contemplating the world through the synthesis of race and romance. For example, in his criteria of Negro art, Du Bois pivots from his inquiry into the nature of African American art towards a broader speculation on African American gaze, an African American gaze that works in contradistinction to that of white Americans. <laughs> 
once in a while, through all of us, there flashes some clairvoyance, some clear idea of what America really is. We who are dark can see America in a way that white Americans cannot, and are seeing our country thus, are we satisfied with its present goals and ideals? In high school where I studied, we learned most of Scott's Lady of the Lake by heart. In afterlife once, it was my privilege to see the lake. It was a Sunday, it was quiet, you can glimpse the deer wandering in unbroken forests, you could hear the soft ripple of romance on the waters, around me fell the cadence of that poetry of my youth, I fell asleep full of the enchantment of the Scottish border. Du Bois proceeds to compare his experience at Loch Catherine with those of white excursionists to suggest that white Americans could not truly see the world before them, but more importantly that they could not visualize what the world could be if they were, quote, really beautiful, if we African Americans had the true spirit, if we had the seeing eye, the cunning hand, and the feeling heart. I want to point this out as a complementary piece to his double consciousness, with important differences in the endpoints of what he considers to be racial consciousness that he links to romance. Here explicitly you linked through Scott. Here again we see the moment of Du Bois dreaming through Scott's romance, which he unspills into a conjecture about a broader experiential perspective that gives African Americans some clairvoyance, that encompasses the nation's foundational principles, its deviations from them, and the possibilities of reconstructing America through a unique awareness of the country's flaws. This perspective echoes his formulation of double consciousness, but the implications of romantic consciousness are far more optimistic, albeit still nebulous, uh, than his diagnosis of African-American life. Absent are the fundamental critiques of blackness and the gaze upon blackness that renders black knife to be a problem. Instead, he begins to formulate a critical vocabulary under the generic veil of romance that reads black life aspirationally. Capability and wholeness supplants the fracturing of self and social denials uh, proposed in the souls of black folk. Romantic consciousness permits the intellectual realization his work enacts through its optimistic recuperation of the past to create a utopian future. He writes, we black folk uh, for, uh, may help for we have within us a, a race as a race, a new stirrings, stirrings of the beginning of a new appreciation of joy, of a new desire to create, of a new will to see. As though in this morning of our group life, we have awakened from some deep sleep that at once dim, dimly mourns the past and dreams a splendid future. Du Bois seeds romance into his writing, in part because of its generic functions, its imaginative allowances that evade conceptual closure by containing some mysterious surplus, to use a phrase from James and Peggy Knapp's recent book on, on romance. And I, I was rereading Cord Redeker's book today, uh, and also he's, he has this really great thing about uh, sort of like the closure and lack of closure that I, I think to be productive here too. To engage with uh, Du Bois, it is necessary to reckon with the legacies that he adopts from these literary traditions. And just as a point of clarification, I'm using romance in the way that Du Bois would have. That's quite loosely. I, I focus on the genre's uh, ability to uh, defy conceptual closure, particularly in how they destabilize the forms of political arguments and the context that they inhabit. Um, in the interest of keeping this short, I want to quickly turn to, uh, to his Dark Princess, or romance. This is his longest romance. Uh, I have a few more examples of him using uh, romance in this kind of way, and we can look at this if we would like to. I'm really interested in how he uses it in empirical spaces, but like, like I said, for, for time constraints, I'm going to just keep it to one example. Uh, so this is Du Bois' most ambitious experiment. His most experienced experiment to pull away from an explicit sociological assessment of black contemporary, co contemporary black America and to issue a far more unruly challenge to his reader to move beyond the existing racial and political alignments. The story follows a character named Matthew whose attempts to become a doctor are frustrated because of the color of his skin. He leaves the country in frustration and somehow gets entangled in this international cabal of leaders of, of people of color who want to study the place of African Americans on the global stage. Matthew is tasked with returning to America and periodically reporting back. At the same time, he falls in love with the leader of this organization, organization, the titular Dark Princess. Generally, this text is considered to be a sustained reading of space in relationship with black America. It moves from New York to Chicago and eventually ends up in the US South with brief interludes in Germany and references to India. And of course, uh, Matthew is, uh, is an ideal stand-in for Du Bois, the sociologist who fam felt similarly tasked with reporting on black America. However, I would argue that the romance privileges the liberatory the possibility of imagination against the modern constructed world. This is a productive overlap uh, be between his generic designation Du Bois gives the text and the political stance its main character takes. 
Matthew steadily grows disenchanted with formal politics throughout the text and eventually inhabits this extra political space. After years of working towards holding political office, he quits just as he's about to claim victory and retreats into a space that refuses the political world around himself and indulges instead in fantasy. By the end of the text, he goes a step further and re he reunites with the princess who's given birth to his child. And the text makes this, gen uh, this abrupt generic shift into this anachronistic mode of the pageant. Representatives of people of color from around the world appear before Matthew to present his golden child to him as a picture of future racial unity. The plotting of Dark Princess is consonant with its generic framing. It's abundantly clear that Du Bois frames the Dark Princess within a Midsummer Night's Dream, quite literally by placing it between a frontispiece dedicated to Titania and an envoy that concludes the romance that concludes his romance, which clearly alludes to Shakespeare's Fairy Queen and Puck's apology to the audience. Moreover, the golden child at the text's conclusion uh, recalls a colonial fa fantasy that inflects the comedic plot between Oberon and Titania, who vie for possession of the little changeling, a boy stolen from an Indian king. Du Bois engrafts his romance onto Midsummer uh, in part to recognize the longevity of colonial fantasies and to reorient them in terms of productive exchange away from outright theft. Repurposing Shakespeare to redraw familiar contours of the global color line is an artistic choice that the text evokes, but leaves unresolved in the final lines of its envoy that reads this. This is at the top here, uh, which is really, uh, really truth, fact, or fancy, the dream of the spirit or the pain of the bone. This moment echoes Puck's appeal to his audience. If we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended, that you have slumbered here with these visions did, which the, while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme no more yielding than a dream. Puck's underlining proposition is a metatheatrical one that calls into question the power of fantasy to transmute tragedy into comedy. That is, he calls attention to the conceptual shifts the audience must bridge to accept the play before them as a unified whole. In the case of Du Bois, the question he leaves to the audience similarly prompts them to consider the unimportant of his own silly romance as a productive space that can be read as having value that is apart from the clinical appraisal of black American politics that so occupied so much of the text. At the risk of overstanding the metaphor, he's asking the reader to draw to dream across the color line. This conclusion, like Puck's speech, operates in excess of the text's boundaries. The reader is, is to linger in a state of uncertainty at the narrative's culmination. It cannot be rightly called propagandistic. Du Bois is thinking about the open-ended possibilities of genre writ large. As Y. Chi Dimmick argues, literature has not solidified as far as we know and will never solidify into a congealed shape. Its force of incipience pulls and strains against all taxonomic regimes. The spilling over of phenomena from labels stands here as an ever-present likelihood, a challenge to any systematizing claim. In Du Bois's transition from a, performing a sociologically aware reading of blackness to a romance of the global color line, we see a correspondence between his thinking about genre and race, the unresolved and the residual. And so I'm going to skip a little bit uh, forward in this so that we can get to uh, sort of some of the, the questions I want to ask and some of the terms I want to use. So to conclude this talk, I want to consider what we ought to do with Du Bois's interest in romance and the misapprehension of his medieval work. And here I want to cast the critical moves I make as consonant with those uh, with, made in a volume that came out earlier this year entitled Timelines of American Literature, edited by Cody Mars and Christopher Hager. They argue that current forms of periodization threaten to be an anchor keeping American literature tethered to the shoals of the past by limiting its ability to speak to the historical conjectures that lie outside of the moment. I'm thinking of that reading Du Bois through the lens of romantic consciousness provides an opportunity to be cognizant of the intersections of multiple fealty crosses and to see medievalism as an attempt to dream beyond the politics and generic formulations of his time. And to advance this point and to raise some questions germane to the subject of this conference, I would like to read Du Bois at the meeting of two terms that I think illuminate the flexibility of his work and the need to read Du Bois outside of the terms that have been erected around him. And those terms are appropriation and propriety. And so here, this is me transitioning to the, uh, the, the, the Q&A. So these are the two terms I wanted to hold on to. I want to begin from the angle of appropriation, and this is obviously is a difficult word in both the realms of African American studies and in medieval studies, although they meet at odd angles. In the case of African American literature, the conversation is predominantly about the questions of love and theft, the power of white people have to transform parts of black culture and then proprietarily claim it as new. More fundamentally, the questions around appropriation center on blackness as political identity, the contents over which lines one is permitted to cross, and to what extent those crossings can compromise the authenticity of some essential racial expression. 
the power of that paradigm is such that it can often overshadow acts of appropriation that work in contrary, contrary to logics of power of familiar narratives of authenticity. And here I'm thinking about Frederick Douglass's borrowings from the Colombian orator to use, his, to use the expression in David Blight's new uh, biography of him to master the master's language and create a vision of the country outside of the shadow of slavery. And I'd venture to make a similar argument about Du Bois. As you saw earlier in the example of Cornell West's argument about Du Bois, his mobilization of his readings left him vulnerable to the critique that he was enthralled to Western modes of thought. And this is compounded by how deeply enmeshed his political writing could be within the fantasies of the West. Knighthood, chivalry, the ethics of, uh, uh, the, uh, knighthood, chivalry, the ethics of a pre-modern and seemingly innocent European world that colored his acts of appropriation. It's here that we intersect with the issues that arise from medieval appropriation more broadly. We medievalists remember quite cl clearly the rally of Charlottesville and um, the misuse of uh, medieval imagery as part of the means to manufacture a simulacrum of a pure ethnic history, a comfortable fantasy that was somehow preferable to the reality of a complex and, and inter uh, intersecting social identity of the country. And in the face of the ugliness of the rally and the tragedy that ensued, we medievalists had to confront the legacy of appropriations that is undoubtedly part of our field of study. Du Bois's desire to appropriate medieval tropes or to incorporate romance into his writing seems to be beyond a bit of intellectual snobbery. He perhaps even skirts the territory of political betrayal because of his willingness to embrace the glitter and his unwillingness to embrace the glitter and tinsel of Lennox Avenue, which is what people said about him. Uh, that is, he seemed to be profoundly out of step with the politics of his time. And more puzzlingly, Du Bois seemed to be out of step with himself. In these moments of utilizing romance, he seems not just to slip genre, he loses hold of the trenchant and timely critiques and instead grafts as fantasies and improbable solutions to racial problems. However, as I hope I've suggested, this approach to reading Du Bois is a critical error, and to read him is to lose in this way is to lose sight of Du Bois's approach to advancing beyond the confines of contemporary political arguments. In indeed, I would guardedly call upon the term of appropriation in the context deployed by Erin Panofsky in his classic Renaissance and Renaissances in Western art, which describe, uh, which is described as the taking up of a representational style uh, for a purpose diametrically opposed to its original significance. I use this admittedly dated perspective on appropriation to try to reposition Du Bois's work within a set of claims that cast him outside of the logics of his contemporary moment. Du Bois is making a set of anachronistic moves that are meant to intercede in and upend the representational forms he quotes, rather than simply revel in them for their own purpose. And I want to quickly add my final term, and then I'll be out of here, um, the term propriety. In terms of propriety, I likewise guardedly invoke another uh, thinker to frame uh, the term, this time Fred Moten his thinking about normative striving against the grain of the very radicalism for which the desire for norms is derived. I want to mobilize a scrap of it to think about the optimism that is latent within Du Bois. Part of the critical misunderstanding of Du Bois is his concern with propriety as a very different, of a very different, as a very different sort of black radical tradition became more prominent around him. Indeed, Claude McKay memorably described the Crisis magazine under Du Bois as, quote, holy clean and righteous pure, as a way to convey how out of step it was with the rest of the black intellectual world, as well as the life of the streets. However, I hope that this work can begin to put Du Bois' seemingly moments of normative propriety in relationship to the radical anti-normative moves that artists around him were making. Du Bois uses the medieval moves to make the seemingly appropriate themes uncanny, displacing them in a number of culturally contradictory and discursively estranged locations. As he noted earlier, this is visible in his speculative arguments, encroachment on the, uh, on the empirical, on his, or in his discourse on chivalry within arguments about colonization. And I hope, I hope you can see I'm trying to bring together these two fields and these two kinds of discourses. Du Bois's use of romance performs this task, this double task of radically rendering visible aspects of black life that were obscure or unrecoverable, but also conjecturing a political order that he would like to see made manifest. This is to say that Du Bois does not abdicate his responsibilities as a thinker, nor is he satisfied with the terms of political discussions as they informed uh, discussions around black life. It may be more useful to exfoliate early legacies of African American writers of speculative fiction like Du Bois to see the appeal of silly romances as a means for temporarily shedding the familiar worries of the world in order to imagine a wholly new one. So that's my talk. Um, a little over time. <laughs> So, uh, so quickly, just like the questions that I, was, I tried to sort of build into the talk and it was sort of leveraging towards at the end, I wonder how do we relate appropriation, speculation, and temporality? How do we think about, oh, are, is it, 
Is this microphone, is the microphone is like doing a little thing. Uh, how, do we have the vocabulary to talk about black speculative fiction when it intersects with medievalism on its own terms? And do we have any thoughts about the connection of blackness and dreaming, right? This is the thing that I'm, it's like, you know, a lot of my talks are a little bit wooly and this is like the, maybe the wooliest part of the talk. All right, so any thoughts about this would be very helpful. The microphone doesn't like me either. <laughs> Questions? Or answers. <laughs> we see a, a, a hand over here. Hi, um, thank you very much for your talk. So I'm coming from the field of German, so I have a particular kind of framing and interest in this. And, and Du Bois is all about German. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so what I was thinking about was also kind of, uh, which doesn't exactly address your, your questions, but the concept of romance and romantic, and then mm -hmm. that kind of concept of developing a mythology, but also the, the idea of, uh, f for me, thinking about German romanticism, it is often about a quest, mm -hmm. a searching, a conceptualization in many ways connects to an idea of a dream and, ro and kind of a, a, a reassessing of where roots come. Naturally, right. uh, uh, naturally sorry, I'm switching into German, sorry. Um, uh, of course, this can become incredibly problematic in terms of nationalism, et cetera. Right. But I'm also wondering, uh, I'm wondering what you think about how this experience in Germany of him spending those years there and how perhaps this kind of interaction with the mythology, how it was being redeveloped, uh, rediscoveries of medieval literature, tropes, genres, et cetera, um, could have informed uh, as almost like a window or a way of lifting the veil for um, African Americans and of moving forward, of finding their own way and quest? Right. No, I think, I think this is a really productive question. Thank you for that. I mean, a lot of his work, and I didn't get to, um, I didn't get to some of the examples of the, his empirical work in this talk, but he's constantly coming back to the quest narrative in places where it doesn't really seem to make sense to do so. He'll be writing something about, like, reconstruction, and then he'll start talking about, he'll, like, some to allegory and start talking about the quest. And so I think that that is, like, sort of, like, sort of how he's, like, sort of thinking about how to structure even empirical questions, or even sort of the ways in which he would be thinking about very, sort of, uh, uh, seemingly uh, generic forms that would have nothing to do with the quest narrative. Um, he also seemed, I, I, I think I have a, this up here. was reading romance, uh, like actually literally like reading like, um, he read like Percival and he had, um, uh, I don't think I had, I don't think I have it up here, but he, had, he was reading, uh, he was reading Percival and talking about how like even turn, going back to like that kind of romance, going back to Germany and thinking you could actually sort of see the roots of blackness in medieval romance as well. So he's like even using that to sort of contradict the sort of narrative of whiteness in the Middle Ages. So I think that, that this is all over that. Thank you. Sure. I wonder also if this is, um, I, I loved your talk and I love the question that you're posing to us, which is so hard, um, but I wonder if part of the dilemma, particularly around dreaming and speculation, is part of the dilemma of the black academic. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like, right, I mean, your dream narratives are, are formed by what you've learned. Mm. And in many ways, if you've received a kind of traditional education, mm. um, you're going to necessarily reconstruct your dreams in terms that are familiar. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if like outside of black academia, that, that I wonder if these terms would seem the same or I don't know, it's just a question because it does seem like, I think the tale that you're telling about Du Bois is one that I've heard over and over again from black academics mm. living today. So. Right, right. I mean, that's, uh, that's really interesting, right? I think that there's something 
there's something kind of uh, complex and sort of tragic about Du Bois because I think he's using dreams to actually to break out of ac the, uh, the academy. He's trying to really use it as a way of communicating with people. He's reading like whatever these silly romances are and sort of saying like, I, can I emulate that? Can I do that kind of thing where people can escape into my work? Uh, but there's like kind of like an agon within it where he's like still doing sociological work but also still trying to dream. So I think you're right that he's like, he's, he's in those confines but he's also trying to imagine new ones, right? He's trying to find a new way of, of like getting out of those sorts of confines. So I'm not really sure like what to do with that. Like how how do you, like I I guess part of the goal of this talk is to and this is like something that's difficult to do is to try to argue for something uncategorizable about Du Bois, right? That it's not just being in like the academy or not being in an academy. He's just trying to like sort of find some new space for himself to occupy that he can draw other people into. And as you say, that it was not just not legible to people. That's what I find so fascinating is this idea of Ill illegibility. And you're, you're right. Maybe it's part of his academicizing of it, even though he's trying so desperately hard to sort of read. You know, there's a part in uh, in um, in uh, Dark Princess where you know he's like working on a subway line and he's like digging in the, the earth and he's like you know I'm a man of the people but he's clearly not right <laughs> like you know I cannot imagine Du Bois like digging anything so yes. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. That was that was so interesting and I um, it helped me to I think see something that I I hadn't seen before which is I I wonder if part of the Part of what's going on in the romantic consciousness that you're describing, and I think it's, it's related to this academic, non-academic mm -hmm. uh, dichotomy, which is a false dichotomy, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, or, or the point is that it is kind of a false dichotomy, right. because I think, you know, I wonder about the extent to which um, what looks like academic engagement mm -hmm. to other scholars, um, to white scholars and to other scholars as well, is in fact just a kind of literary and historical specificity mm -hmm. that Du Bois mm -hmm. is bringing to what mm -hmm. he's doing, right? And I think, you know, and I wonder also if the, um, the perception of like this, um, the use of dreaming and imagining sort of works against that in a way because it, it makes that, you know, it, it creates this expectation mm -hmm. that the past is something sort of inchoate, right? right? And sort of idealized. Whereas, I mean, to think about, um, I, I wonder if another way to kind of talk about how Du Bois is sort of deploying these traditions is that he is, um, deploying them with a certain kind of real literary and historical specificity right. that we tend to think of as academic and yet you know that's the, it, it, the point of it for him is not that it's academic the point is that it's a, a different kind of engagement right right I mean this is like something there's something thank you for that question or thank you for that response I, I think there's something really interesting in there about how he uses allegory for this right like allegory works for him in both as like highly specific like he's thinking about like this happens this happens this happens this is like a sort of a genealogy of like expectation and uh, colonization, but it's also allegory, right? So it actually is, it cannot really be that specific at all. And so he slips into allegory and it just seems like a strange thing. And for, I think for some people, it seems very, uh, very much like as you're describing this kind of like historical specificity, even though he means it to do something completely different. Yeah, thank you. So um, I really enjoyed your pushing us to think about the term mm -hmm. of the conference, mm -hmm. appropriations, and um, the question that you sort of slightly laid out that appropriation is really imagined as a power structure mm. related to racialized identity right. and authenticity. So should we use appropriation when we talk about things that are just recycled, remixed, mm -hmm. remediated from mm -hmm. this medieval past? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think maybe that's, I'm wondering about this. Right. It's sort of been, um, working through my brain right. um, and why is it that we or a lot of medievalists want to say appropriation medieval appropriation right. when the power dynamic is not there right. in any way right. and it's about whiteness usually mm -hmm. and not so is there other terminology or what I mean we, we need to kind of work through this bit right. um, I actually have recently also said something in relationship to the New Zealand shooter, mm -hmm. and I basically said he's shit posting. Mm -hmm. It's not in any way interested in actual historical accuracy, any of that. Right, right. It's just, let's pull everything that we possibly can to signal a certain thing to a certain audience. Right. And um, at least in a kind of digital media discussion, basically he's shitposting. Right, right. Thank you for that, yes. 
Um, do you want to respond to that? I, I feel like because this is supposed to be a discussion, I, I mean, it'd be, it'd be nice if like, there's like kind of, if we could talk to each other well, too. Yeah, I mean, it's just a piggyback yeah. off of yeah. uh, Dorothy's point. And by the way, I love your book. Uh, oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is building upon this question too, and I'd, I'd be curious about what, how you would think about this, these particular forms of medievalism at the turn of the century and affect, mm -hmm. right? So how's it diff how is medieval, what's the relationship between affect and medievalism from within a black paradigm where medievalism is operating on its own terms? So mm -hmm. what, what is the affect of work of medievalism mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. case? So right. That, okay. That's a broader question I want to ask. Okay. I, it, may, it may be jumping off a little bit too far. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to connect them <laughs> as much as I can, but I feel like I not, may not be able to do that. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of, like, I don't want to get rid of the term appropriation because it's such a useful term, and I think we just need to actually sort of try very much, to, like, yeah, to specify this in some way. That's why I introduced the Panofsky. I know that that's, like, Panofsky seems a little fusty at this point, but I think he actually had something really interesting when he talks about appropriation and giving a sort of new definition to appropriation that works a little bit better than the, the definition that I think we kind of commonly use. Um, and so maybe that would be one way of thinking about how to like structure the sort of language around appropriation and then doing what you're saying is sort of saying like this is not what appropriation looks like. This is, you know, this other person is doing this thing that is like completely wild and like has nothing to do with the actual, uh, what the actual politics of appropriation really are. Um, in terms of affect, I'm not really certain how to answer that question. I, I, I struggle with this because I wanted to write this talk of kind of about affect and like his effective responses to like being this like, sort of soaking up romance. I find that to be like, like the sort of like the, the next step of him dreaming is that like he has this kind of effective relationship with these, these romances. I don't have enough evidence to really sort of go into like what he was reading and how he was responding to that other than these sort of scraps. And so I've been, I've sort of like kind of excised that from this talk, but I really do think that there is a, there is an affective move that he has there too of his kind of pleasure of romance, right? That I think that that's part of what's underlying this talk and what's underlying his writing is his desire for romance. So I, I think there's kind of like, yeah, there's, there, there's that as well. That the, um, one of the common critiques of the book when it came out of, uh, of Dark Princess, when it came out was that it was the, a, a dirty old man's fantasy. Uh, that's how people des described it. And like, but there's like, they're responding to kind of the weird aff affective like response, uh, affective like kind of moves that he was making inside of the text where he kind of luxuriates inside of like the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of early modern medievalisms that he uses. So I, I, it's kind of a curious thing. But again, I think that that marks why, why it's, it didn't kind of work, you know? Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I don't, kn I miss speaking and take my pictures, but I don't, um, I guess I'm not sure if you've considered, I guess thinking about Du Bois's notoriously bad takes on gender to be generous, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. especially black women, please don't get me started. Um, but I think, how do we think about this sort of uh, romanticism that you're drawing our attention to, the speculation? Um, with respect to black women especially, mm. I think thinking about the kind of absenting that you see right. of black women mm -hmm. in these archives, like thinking, you know, um, with the early modern as well and kind of extending that. Um, how do you see this kind of like extending in that direction or do you see it extending in that direction? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is this is uh, this is kind of the briar patch of Du Bois' criticism, right? That this is like that like um, that like this is you're you're raising exactly the right point that he is uh, you know people have been trying to recuperate Du Bois instead of say like well, actually he wasn't as like misogynistic as people say he didn't like sort of leave uh, women particularly black people uh, black women out in the cold but I think that I think he really did right and I think that he's kind of a, a bit of a product of like reading uh, reading. Um, reading the Middle Ages in kind of his own like kind of very narrow way. And I think that he, he reads uh, the Middle Ages in a way that uh, is sort of in, is, is, is inclusive in some ways and then deeply exclusive in other ways. So uh, I, I would, that's the way I would start to approach that, that yes, you're right, that he, that he doesn't really sort of seem to be interested in the question of, um, of black women, except for in the case of um, this kind of quest narratives, right? Like the sort of the the Princess Steel that I, the example I gave you of is like the the sort of woman is figured as a resource to be exploited, and the Dark Princess woman is at the beginning, woman is at the end, like, and then that's that's kind of it, right? And she is like kind of like sort of described as this jewel to to be had. So I think that like they're 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 but merely used as props inside of his work, yeah. So thank you very much for that talk. Um, 
I'm the afraid of this question. <laughs> <laughs> Please go, go for it. Yeah. The last several questions have all been taking me back to the end of the Princess Steel, which is something I've been giving a lot of attention to lately. Um, I was wondering if in your idea of romantic consciousness, you might expound upon or theorize a bit more on uh, on uh, temporality. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because, of course, when we discuss appropriations and the usual power dynamics involved, when we're talking about appropriations of the medieval or of the early modern, um, that text tends to reverse that uh, the usual temporal power dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and this actually also engages the young lady's yep. question yep. About, uh, about the role of women in the text as well. So of course at the end of that text uh, you do have this um, the princess Steele mm. who is a black woman daughter of the uh, daughter of the the queen of iron mm. um, out of Africa mm. um, who is the desired object of these two knights um, and of course at the end of the text she has all of the power over them and when she, uh, I'm, I'm really struck by that moment, and I apologize for those of you who have not read The Princess Steel, I'm getting into the weeds here. But at the end of that text, as she's, uh, uh, as she's trying to enchant uh, the knight she actually does like back yeah. to healing, yeah. she pulls one of her curls yeah. and completely, and I think you used the word uncanny, mm -hmm. uncannily messes with, um, uh, uh, orders of existence, right. ontologies, and temporalities right. in that by pulling one of her curls and flinging it right. in this apparently sort of medieval questing space, she in turn causes the 1906 San Francisco earthquake <laughs> and the 1908 earthquake in Valparaiso, both of which are two major, you know, two of you know, the most major uh, news stories of the day when Du Bois is working on this thing, mm. you know, sometime around 1908. Um, so I was just wondering if you might theorize on that a little further. How is this, uh, how is this kind of uncanny relationship mm -hmm. to temporality um, uh, a, a part of Du Bois's romantic consciousness? Huh. That's really great. Uh, it's, it's funny, I, I had not been reading the text in that way at all, so it might take me a little bit to, to, to sort of work through that, because what I find to be interesting about the temporality of this, and this is a different way of answering the question that was just asked, was about how, um, so there's like, you know, there's a husband, there's a wife, and like the husband gets to see through this like sort of seeing stone, uh, or this like this sort of megascope, and the wife does not, and like she, he won't even describe what it is that he has seen. He's it's sort of this kind of like, oh, not yet for you, of a thing that happens at the very end of it and so that's how I sort of saw sort of saw the kind of gender and temporality sort of working inside of this text where they're like these men have an access to this thing that this woman does not in terms of like the temporality and the uncanny I'm I'm really not sure what to do with that that that, that sort of moment of like sort of uh, projection backwards into into the into um, into the present right I I'm really not sure what to do with that like that it feels like no, I, 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 don't, I don't even want to conjecture at this point. Like, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what to, to do with that. I think you're asking a really smart question about it. I really don't have a, a direction to go. Do you, do you have any thoughts about this? <laughs> yeah. You know, is this a kind of simple uh, uh, sedimentation of history that he's right, recognizing? Right. But of course, all of his use of the medieval could be said to, to do that. I think there's something more important going on here in the fact that, of course, this is, you know, as Russert and Brown have pointed out, I mean, this is a, this story is also very much about quote unquote primitive accumulation. Right, right. Um, certainly she is the princess steel, the text is really engaged with the use of steel to as the newest major building technology. Right. The text is right. invested right. in the what was at the time the tallest mm. skyscraper in New mm. York, which was also a neo-Gothic skyscraper, right. Right. something we don't have a lot of anymore. Right. Um, so, you know, so this is uh, there's a there's a there's a swirl of resonances. Mm going on there, but I do think it's more, 
um, I think it's more directed and more 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 carefully thought about right. by Du Bois than anyone has given him credit for yet. Right. right. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I think we should talk about this further. We should talk about this further. Yeah, there's something fa fascinating about. The, I mean, I've, again, we, I think we're just reading very differently, and which is really great. I just feel like I focused on the medieval scrying stone and like the mappability of history, and that you can map one thing and then bring it out to some other thing. And like, if you just have enough information, it's a very sort of sociologist move. If you just have enough information, you can get from point A to point B. Uh, as, but like, I, I like what you're doing with the idea that this is a, an, an uncanny moment of that. Yeah, thank I you. I think you. You're right to bring up his, his role as a sociologist yeah. here. I think he's somewhat troubling the methodologies exactly. of the field because this whole creation of the apparatus mm -hmm. at the beginning of the text, exactly. it's, too, it's too whirly, you know, it's too <laughs> swirly, yeah. right, for most sociologists. And of course, this is why those two students, or former students who come in, think he's a quack. Mm. Yep, yep, the, the whirly gig that he makes, yeah. That takes us to time for our first speaker, so we have a round of applause for Matthew Vernon.